I always check with the sound crew because they, they make me sound good. It's a shame the video crew can't make me look good. <laughs> Using PowerShell to be a Linux administrator. I'm Steven Judd. I am your presenter for this glorious content. These are our sponsors. You guys have seen them a lot for this, uh, this week, but we are thankful for the sponsors because without sponsors, there's no PowerShell Summit. Who am I? Quick introduction in case you've been fortunate enough not to be introduced to me prior to right now. I'm Steven Judd. I'm a multi-year, multi-discipline IT pro. I don't say how many years because it's been a few. I'm a PowerShell enthusiast. If you're looking at me and you can't figure out that I'm a PowerShell enthusiast, see your doctor. <laughs> I'm also a dad joke enthusiast. So if you've listened to me and you can't figure that out, see your audiologist. I'm also a fashion icon. Yeah, probably not. Yeah, I heard the laughs. What? No. By the way, I have that on a sticker. Please come see me for one if you want one. But who is this talk for besides the people in the room? Well, these are people that are primarily Windows users that need to use Linux or maybe just want to use Linux. And this is not a talk to convince Linux users to start using Windows, because I bet you already do, poor Linux users. We've heard your groans. Uh, but unlike this person, I don't mess with penguins, because bad things happen when you mess with a little fluffy bird. Now, this I find interesting because I'm gonna live in demo, click on Stack Overflow, and hard to see, so Windows, uh, hold down the Windows key and hit plus and you get auto zoom. And you can zoom in more and then you hit minus to zoom out. Pro tip. What's interesting about this is Bash has been declining on Stack Overflow for the questions and PowerShell has continued to climb. So people are more interested. Now does that mean that PowerShell is taking over from Bash? Gracious no. No, but there's more questions. So maybe all the bash questions have been answered in the universe and uh, we don't need to ask them anymore. Or maybe ChatGPT is affecting this too. But I did find that interesting. Back to the slides. I'm hoping that might convince at least one Linux user to start using PowerShell. That really is the point here is that you can use PowerShell on Linux. The question is why? Uh, it is a PowerShell and DevOps conference after all. So the question, the thing that I want to mention next is how did I become a Linux administrator? Because in my 30 years of IT, oops, I said multi, many years, uh, now I've given away the ship. 30 years plus, I've been a Windows administrator the entire time. So this is my first job where it wasn't a contract job, where I've been primarily tasked with administrating Linux. You got to pay the bills. I mean, let's be real. So when you lose a job, like happened to me, and you need a job, and someone offers you a job, and that job is a Linux admin job, you gotta pay the bills. Now I'm fortunate in that I went to an excellent organization with great leaders and really exceptional coworkers, so I'm, I landed good. I was happy being a Windows, Azure Cloud, DevOps, digital security, enterprise messaging administrator. And yeah, those are all roles I've had in my career within the last six years. <laughs> Good times. But when those positions were eliminated, I needed a new position. And my skills rhymed. This is what one of the founders of the org that hired me said to me when I asked him, you know, why me for this organization? Why would you hire a traditionally Windows administrator to come in and administrate your systems? And he said, yeah, you don't have direct experience, but what you do have rhymes with what we do have. In other words, if you can solve problems on Windows, you can solve problems on Linux. If you're comfortable automating in PowerShell, you can automate using Bash or Python or Perl or whatever. You just need to learn the language. The mental concepts all work. And so I now work at a SaaS company with zero Windows servers. Uh, the company is 10 Street, we're 10street.com and we're in the transportation industry. So here's the inescapable parts. Because if you don't know these, PowerShell is not gonna help you. Oh shoot, maybe I should have put a title on there, but no! Linux is fundamentally a text-based operating system. Once you get that in your head, you're like, oh okay, everything's text. That's good, and that's bad. We'll talk about why. But if you cannot read or edit text files, you're in trouble. So in other words, cat more or less, that is a cat more or less, 
Okay, whatever. But you need to understand how to read files. You need to know how to keep them on screen. Less is interesting because it's you know kind of like a text editor that you can scroll around. It's not an editor, a reader that you can scroll around in. All right, well, here's your PowerShell equivalents, right? Git content, outhost, dash paging, and null. Oops, null. Well, because there's not a PowerShell equivalent to less. There's just not. Vivim, Nano, Emacs, whatever. I'm not going to fight you over a text editor. Pick one that works for you. Learn it. Use it. Um, because you guys have too much Vim and Vigor for me anyway. That's, that's not worth the fight. But you must know one that's available. So if you're an Emacs aficionado and you love it, but it's not on your system and you have to install it in order to get it to work, that's some fr friction and resistance, right? That's why I, I almost, I, I learned Vi, and Vi is pretty much ubiquitous. Living off the land is not just a principle for digital security, it's also for all of us. All right, so CHMOD, or however it's pronounced, change mode. You need to know how to read this if you're gonna be a Linux administrator. Because if you can't read that, you're gonna struggle with file systems and, and file properties, okay? I'm not gonna try and explain it. You just, if you wanna be a Linux admin, you gotta be able to read that. You do not wanna be this guy. <laughs> because you don't wanna give everyone full control and not give anyone else control. All right, Chone, change owner. Be careful because you're only one backwards R from clowning yourself. This one takes a minute. You see the backwards R and then the clown? Okay. <laughs> That's kind of a visual joke. I don't know how that'll come off on the podcast. <laughs> so this is one of the hardest concepts actually for Windows admins to get used to is the POSIX file system. And yes, I'm POSIX that this is true. Next to cap sensitivity, which is an abomination. Now, I got into an interesting conversation with Ben Reeder, who uh, is an awesome dude and very knowledgeable, and he's like, cap sensitive matters. And I'm like, yeah, if you're a monster. But this is a come at me, bro. I've, again, 30 years of Windows. I've been in since DOS, uh, DOS 3.0 specifically. I don't, I don't do things in cap sensitivity. But Linux has had that since the 70s. So depending upon which path you got your career started in, that matters, okay? POSIX has owner, group, and everyone permissions, and that's it. NTFS, as you guys probably know, has a many-to-one relationship. Well, that's what I learned when I learned permissions once I got Windows 3.5 advanced server. Yeah, I've been at this a little bit. Okay, but where will PowerShell help you, okay? List files. Linux, it's LS, PowerShell, it's get child item. If you've been using Windows PowerShell, you know there's a built-in alias for LS. I've been using LS as my how to get files in PowerShell since 2010, because ring finger, ring finger is faster than every other option. Processes, PS, get process. Yeah, they line up. List command locations, which, get command. You see how the, these things are starting to line up? It's almost like someone thought about this. Right? Or possibly borrowed, right? Jeffrey Snover did it have a, a strong Linux or Unix background. So that stuff bled into how PowerShell was designed. Find, get child item filter. Okay, but why bother? Like why bother learning PowerShell when you have to do all this Linux stuff anyway? Like if you know the Linux commands, what are we doing here? Well, it's because you can leverage your PowerShell knowledge. Now remember, the who was this for? It's for Windows people that are kind of gravitating into the Linux world. And in case you hadn't noticed, the cloud is very heavily Linux. And if you haven't done anything with containers, Windows containers exist, but they're big. If you want speed and fast, you go Linux, okay? And readability matters. Readability always matters. PowerShell is too verbose, I want less. Yes, I've heard people say these words. I'm like, yeah, are you a Perl developer? <laughs> okay, which one of these would you rather read? Option one, option two. Now I'll give you a second to kind of cogitate on that. I can read the second one because I've been doing PowerShell for a while. I don't even have to think about it. Now, truth is, 
they are both complicated. But without thought, I know what the second one does, really. It's listing all the files that match error, but don't start with status, and it puts that into a variable called file list. Then I get put file list into sort length, so I get the longest ones at the bottom, and I select the last five, so I get the biggest ones, and I measure them by their average size, and then that for each average, you may have seen it select dash expand item, expand, expand, I'll show you, expand parameter, expand parameter, but if you do that percent and then the parameter name, it just expands it automatically, so it's a shortcut for that, and then I put it out in one gig. Unless it doesn't have five, or four, or three, or two, or one, then just return a zero. I have no idea what that other one is doing, because once you get to head, in five, oct, total, et cetera, yeah, you're kind of losing me, okay? PowerShell readability helps future you and people other than you. That's one of the powers of it. Objects. Like a good defense attorney, I object. Because parsing text can be hard and complicated. Sorry if I said something awkward. Okay. You guys knew what you were getting when you walked in here. I have zero sympathy for you. By this time, my reputation precedes me. All right. Uh, objects are easy if you can use the native PowerShell commandlets, right? Get child item, get process, stop process, get content, all that business. And if you use native or PowerShell gallery commands to output objects whenever possible, that's, that's a helpful way to go about this. And then uh, read the code from the gallery. This is your PSA. Like, don't just go to the gallery, grab some stuff, because it says it does what you want to do and run it. No, try to limit your CLMs or RGEs. And if you don't know what those acronyms stand for, you're in good shape. Have a drink. You look parsed. You're going to have to parse text. That's just the way it is. Okay, you're going to have to use, you're going to use commands that output text, because if you're doing it on Linux and you do any command, it's outputting text. And you're going to want to use and manipulate this output, because you're not just going to look at it and go, shiny. You want the information that it has given you. And you're going to have to get comfortable with regex. Sorry, not sorry. So what you would have to do if you're using sed and awk anyway, because sed uses regex, and awk has its language, but when you combo those together, you're using regex anyway. There's no escaping it. So you should be also comfortable with regex if you're using select string, uh, match, replace, those commands, because they all use regex. I forgot why grep is on there. Yeah, I don't know. I'm not gonna stop encouraging people to learn regex. It's one of the best things I did for my career, really, when it comes to solving problems. Because I can regex, and those people that can't regex have to, have to fight to figure something out, and I can just do it. Okay, so you need to learn it. Regex 101. I learned something today in Stevie Coaster's, uh, Stevie Valding, Valdinger's uh, session, in that Regex 101 on the left side now has an engine to pick. So I used to say, hey, you need to also use regexer because it uses the .NET regex engine. At some point, they've added the .NET regex engine as a selectable engine on regex 101. So because I like the UI of regex 101 better than regexer, I'm now gonna tell you, do regex 101. There's very little differences until you really get onto the edges of regex. So generally speaking, you don't have to worry about it. You'll be fine. And then here's another one from James Brundage. He built Irregular, so then you can basically run functions using his, his um, module and tell it what you want, and then it'll output the regex for you. So it's pretty cool. I, I recommend you look into it. I say pretty cool. I'm actually quite impressed by it. And ChatGPT, okay. We all know about the hallucinations of ChatGPT if you spend any time on it, however, it is shockingly good at regex because regex is very structured. You know exactly what it's gonna do. So if you do ChatGPT and you say, hey ChatGPT, I need you to write a regex that'll do blah, 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 it'll just say, all right, here's how. And then it'll explain it to you if you're using GPT-4. So do that. And seeing is believing, right? So let's pretend that the output from bash commands is valuable. We're in pretend world anyway. So like cache. 
so you can parse the buck. No? All right, fine. Demo. Ooh, dark mode. Forgot to do this. Didn't really forget. I wanted to show you. I have a profile for my VS Code called demo. And then when I switch it to demo, look at everything move around. Are you using a screen reader to operate VS Code? No. Uh, oops, wrong. That was Windows Plus. I wanted Control Plus. All right, we'll get this thing open. I'll hide Explorer. I'm gonna minimize this for now. How's that readable in the back? Are we good? All right, sweet. All right, so first one up. I, what I was trying to do was I wanted to parse the OS release file in Linux. So I wrote, I actually asked ChatGPT to write this. I'm like, let's see what it does. And here's what it came up with. Now it's interesting, by the way, all my code will be released. So if you don't you know, get what you're looking for out of here, just go look at it later. I don't wanna spend any time on it because I modified it. For example, one of the things it said was parse. Is that a verb? Is that an approved verb? No, it is not. So I rewrote it. I also put help on mine. I'm gonna close the help. So mine is get Linux OS release. And then if you go to the file, I put a default one in there, said it's not mandatory. Now this is kind of redundant. I really don't need that parameter false because if it's not there, it's not there. But since I copied and pasted from this one where it said mandatory true, I had to fix it. Then I checked to see whether or not you're running on Linux. Yeah, so I was working on my demo. I'm like, let me load this code and try it. And it failed. It said, I can't find that file. I'm like, yeah, because I'm running Windows. So now I've got code in there to help me. And then remember how I said regex, here you go. I'm using a match and go look at this and then add properties for each matching value that you come up with. All right, well, let's see what that looks like just for fun. All right, so I'm gonna bounce over here. It's not really for fun, it's part of the presentation. You guys paid for this. We'll do get. Uh, oh, did I not load this? Did I load it in this window? Oh, oh, what have I done? One moment, please. My home directory's empty. I wonder if I reset this. Okay, one second while I sweat my demo up here. Uh, no, I don't want to do change directory, I want to do dot. Hey, there it is. Thank you, PS Reline. Save the day again. Whew. All right, that's convert from output. I need the other one. Get servers, well, it's not that one. Doggone, I thought I had all this loaded and ready to go. There's demo one. Oh, I, re I renamed it, that's why I was like, okay. Demo two, all right, so demo two, I just loaded it, but demo two actually has the git sj. Insert, okay. What are we doing here? Am I calling the wrong thing? Yeah, because it doesn't have SJ in it. <laughs> I was about to really get nervous. All right, it's get Linux, Linux OS release. Ta-da, okay, finally. The hat conceals all the sweat that would normally be running down into my eyes. So yeah, thanks hat. All right, so that's what it did. It took all the properties that it found in that file and turned them into this. So if I do the same thing and I do get member, you can see that, yeah, they're all note properties. But now I can do crazy things with it, like uh, where, now I'm doing it on one system, so this isn't super useful, but if I wanted name to match, remember regex, and I'll do, be you, yeah, it worked, okay? 
that's the one. Well, that's not super useful. Just give me um, select ver star. Ooh, what is my typing? Select ver star. All right, there's the properties with version. That's why you want objects. That right there, that's it. Okay, well, what else? <laughs> you asked, you receive. I wrote this because I got tired of dealing with Ansible. Who here has used Ansible? All right, you can feel my pain because the output looks like JSON, it's not JSON. It has extra stuff and so it smells like JSON but it's not JSON. So I wrote a parser. Now this code, again, will be made available. I'm not gonna try and explain it here because frankly I've, I've got too much stuff to cover and I want you to get all the value from this. But what you can do with it is I'm gonna take, let me go to this first. We're gonna look at the OS release version and you can see that I just did an export CLI XML on this and it's just this, this, this. Okay, well let's bounce over here and say, all right, now I do need to make sure that I have this run loaded, which I needed to do before. It's this one, it's this one, Ooh, it was right there. Convert from Ansible, let me make sure I have that loaded. And then I should be able to do, uh, let's see, I need to pass one into the other. Oh man, I really don't have all this loaded. Oh, good grief. Don't type in presentations. I should have done that. Thank you, Heckler. <laughs> James Brundage, ladies and gentlemen, he told me I should have done this. Okay, so now I need to do this. LS and go look at what these are and where is it? It's OS release version. So OS release version. And now I remembered why this isn't doing it because I need to do import CLI XML and then X and X. Don't type in presentations. Good grief. I'm off the rails up here. X, M, L. So we on Ruby on Rails. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. Version, there. Finally, okay, so that pulls it in as just the pure text object that it is. So then I'm gonna send it to convert, co convert from Ansible command output, and now look at what I get. And I have server name, what the result was, and what the message was. And I added another one in here to say, okay, well, let's expand the array. So instead of that last column being an array of objects, I can do expand array, and then you'll get multiples. Now, in this particular example, there's only one entry per server, so it's not that, it's not that impressive. But if you do something like the next one we're gonna look at, which is the SSHD config XML. Let's take a look at that. Oh, by the way, I've been doing this on a fairly small font. Is this readable? You good? Okay, all right, I apologize. I normally like to make them bigger and I check. All right, so let's go to the last one again. We're gonna do this again here, but instead of OS release, we're gonna look at SSHD config.xml. Okay, so let's see what that looks like. That looks like your normal text output from Ansible, which is just a bunch of junk. Like, okay, yes, you can get the information you need from this and you can do it in Bash. You can do that, but why bother? I'm gonna give you this for free. So we're gonna do the convert, convert from a tab output. And this is what you get. Okay, that's interesting. Now, what was the command that I used to get to run this? I just catted, et cetera, sshd, sshd config. That's what this output is. Okay, cool. Now do the expand array on that one. Here we go. Now you have each one of these listed. Okay, well, that's, that's cool and all, but what I want is where server name Match 22, mach 22. Use tab completion, it will help you. Also don't type in demos. There they are. 
It's cool. Now, how many lines is that? Anyone want to do a, a WC-L on that in Linux, which is word count, and you have to know that? No, 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 we're PowerShell people. We measure. That's why you do it. This is why. Objects matter. Okay, I'm gonna go back to the slides because I think I'm done demoing the seeing is believing part. All right, so the more you know, the more you realize there is more to know, right? Getting started with PowerShell on Linux. So this is the stuff you need to get. You need to get permission. No, that's not actually a command that you can go get, but what it is is you need it because you're gonna to have to go to the security team and you're gonna to have to say, I'm going to make a change to our Linux servers. And they may or may not be excited about it because it's gonna add work to their load, okay? Anytime you add something to the server, you're increasing the attack surface. That sounds obvious, but it needs to be said anyway. Anything you add to a server. By the time an attacker has console access to your server, by the way, you're already toast. So it doesn't matter that PowerShell is a shell, because it is a shell, that's what it is. They're like, oh, but what if someone runs code and then uh, they run it as root on my server? I'm like, my friend, <laughs> let's talk about the problem that exists in your environment, because it's big. Because the connection to the Linux server is still SSH. SSH is solid, there's been very few exploits, they have been there, but then they get shut down really quick because the Linux world runs on SSH. So the commands run on Linux are controlled by the operating system. So just because they got there, it doesn't matter if it's Bash or Python or PowerShell. If they can't run it, they can't run it. Do security right. In the same way that you don't randomly download or compile or run code on your servers, don't randomly download and run scripts, functions, or modules on your servers. Seems a little redundant. All right, so logging. Linux logs to the system D journal by default. So use system or use journal control command to view the system D journal. And so what PowerShell has is really good logging. If someone's using PowerShell to try to exploit your system, they're actually choosing the harder way because PowerShell will log everything it does. And the module logging is interesting because it records pipeline execution events. Okay, but the script block logging logs commands, script blocks, functions, and scripts. It's everything, okay? And this is controlled by the values in the powershell.config.json, and here is the documentation on it. Now, if I had a wish, I, I would change the documentation to give more details because there's some questions about the parameters that I have that the documentation kind of touches on but doesn't cover in depth. So once you really start digging into this, you're gonna to have to spend a little bit more time and you may have to experiment. I'm just telling you that ahead of time because that's what I had to do. All right, we have another demo. Let's see if I can get this demo to work without suffering and pain. So we're gonna start with journal control. It was right there, F. And we're gonna run that. Oh, it gave away the, the story because I, I was doing this while I was testing. All right, so it popped up the last few in here, and the last few was some command that I ran. And so right now, journal control is just sitting there listening, and the dash F is to follow, okay? But nothing's happening. Now, if I go over to this window, this also, just PS version table, show you that I'm running PowerShell, no tricks up my sleeves, because I'm wearing a short sleeve shirt, I have nowhere to hide them. So I'm gonna do find module, Poshkit. Let's do a different one. Because the author's in the audience, I'm gonna pick his. All right, go find that module. Okay, cool, that's the output, we're used to that. Now let's go back over here. Where is it in here? Somewhere in here, in this output, is that fine module. It's hard to read, because it just outputs, it outputs everything. Every last thing that it does, it outputs it. Except I don't see that in there, because it did the last one, because notice it did my function, 
get Linux release. Is it going to live update the uh, output? It's supposed to be live, yeah. Okay. It's interesting that it didn't, didn't put that out. Because it, it, it could be. And I, I really don't want to shut all this down and bring it back up and, and try, to, try to get that going. But the, the thing is, it's going to put a big old stream of data in here. And it's possible that in, from last night to right now, my uh, system logging config, I messed that up somehow. But the point is, is that when, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do one more just, just to see if this does. Here's fun. Oh, yeah. Do you know you can drag tabs off in terminal now? Thank you very much for whoever added that. All right, so I'm gonna leave this over here. I'm gonna do another command. That's interesting because it, it worked before. Uh, PS script star. Oh, yeah, it did it. Exception, unhounded output. PSS script. Good call. Interesting though that even though I did that, I must have it set for module um, for module and not script. I must not have turned that on in my config file. Apologize for that. Uh, but if you go into your settings um, for the for the JSON and you get this turned on, I must not have turned it on. It'll just, it'll pop every last thing that it runs in here. And again, apologies. Let me see if it was just something weird that I did. No, that's the same. Escape. PS read, read. Oh, it's not playing. Man, I just, no, that's the same error before when I when I put something bad in there. So like if I do this and I go junk. No, it's only showing errors. Right. Right. Which means that back here where I said, hey, what your logging is, this PowerShell config JSON file is not set properly. Because if I had gone in here and said, turn on the script block logging, oops, I I was trying to highlight. Had I done that, then we would see it. And so that's, that's a mistake in my demo, apologize, but that's, that's what's happening over here. So it, it's still logging the errors, but it's not doing the script block logging because I didn't turn it on. Yep, that's it. Okay, back to slides here. There's some there's some PowerShell default paths that you need to know, and it's different on Linux than it is on Windows. And so I just, I'm going to detail them here for you so that you kind of get the gist of, hey, this is what's in there. And PS Home is in opt Microsoft PowerShell 7. But the profile scripts are in these locations. Okay. So you need to know where those are because if you're going to do profiles, in your environment, and especially if you're going to centrally manage them for like the all users, all hosts, because you want all of your PowerShell instances across your enterprise to be the same, you need to know where to push this out and how you're going to get that out with your satellite server, Ansible, or Terraform, or however you're doing it. Okay, that's what you need to know. And then the modules are stored in these locations. Okay. Uh, now, like the big shout out, thank you to whoever capitalized the M in modules. Remember the come at me bro about how uh, the, it's case sensitive? Yeah, thank you. And then the PS read line history, my personal favorite. Again, PS read line, it has mixed case, whatever. But you need to know that location. So you can go check your console host history. And then we're gonna run get differences. Well, what does that mean? Sudo. This is super user do. If you're used to Linux, you're used to this command. It is super user do for all of you monsters that pronounce it wrong and call it sudo. It's not sudo, it's sudo. Come at me, bro. You can't just sudo a PowerShell commandlet. This is interesting because one does not simply sudo in PowerShell. 
Yes, I know they're adding sudo to PowerShell and Windows, but in Linux, remember we're talking about Linux. So running sudo runs the command that you tell it to run sudo in, in the super user's shell. The super user's shell is not PowerShell, unless you change your default shell on your Linux system, and I don't recommend doing that, because that can cause some other pain for you. So when you've gone to the super user's shell, you're no longer in PowerShell, okay? But I wrote a function for you, you're welcome. Invoke pseudo. Sudo, sudo, whatever. I messed myself up, how do you like that? <laughs> oh, it's a good thing no one actually takes me seriously. Where's my invoke sudo? I thought I had it open. I guess I didn't. Invoke the sudo function. There we go. It... Well, that can't be it. No, it is. Okay. It's so simple. I actually thought it was a mistake. Like seriously, that wasn't a joke. And I, remember how I said sometimes I say something serious and people don't believe me because I'm joking so much? This is it. You pass it a script block and then it runs sudo PowerShell the script block. That's it. Piece of cake. Again, so simple it even screwed me up. SSH, I'm still talking. Yes, you can set up SSH from PowerShell to Linux servers. And no, it isn't simply the SSH that's already in your Linux servers because you have to add a PowerShell subsystem entry. There's some risk here. Here's the documentation. When you do this, you're changing how SSH works. And remember, you're back to having chats with Linux and security teams. And they're not going to be excited necessarily about you changing how Linux works. Now, if you're a primarily Windows system and you're the one bringing Linux in, then you can start the entire game by saying, here's how we're going to do SSH. So then on my client, I can use invoke command and send it to Windows and to Linux. Rarely is the code that's gonna work on both Windows, Mac, and Linux. This is a nice idea, I love it. Technically, it's sound. It's hard to find use cases for this because you're gonna split your mind. Like if you need to know the version of the operating system, you go to OS release on Linux and Mac, except I don't know where it is on Mac. I'm assuming it works. You don't do that on Windows. You're gonna have to do something else. So your code's gonna have to handle the, the various systems anyway. And remember increasing the attack surface? You're changing how SSH works, that matters. And then your usage. Well, these, these are the ones, these are the commands that will use SSH natively via the host name uh, parameter. And there are some limitations to using it because you don't get remote endpoint configuration or GIA. That's just the way it is. It's in the docs. And you wanna be aware of broken windows with your code. So there are WMI instances running out there that behind the scenes, the code is using WMI. And you load that up, that module up on your Linux system it is not gonna work because you don't have equivalent SIM commands for those either. An example is setting the laptop brightness. It's actually pretty cool because you can use WMI and you can brighten or dim your laptop by sending it commands. Those commands do not exist in SIM. Now you can look at the settings in SIM, you just can't change them. DLLs. Some modules ship with DLLs. Don't worry, PowerShell on Linux has DLLs. I was surprised to find that. I was like, wait, there's DLLs on Linux? Yes, there are. But the DLLs are compatible with Linux, so they work. And it's using the .NET execution engine that's how it works. I was just surprised to see DLLs. I was like, wow, okay. So let's talk about some Linux commands that work in PowerShell, and then we should be out of here. So the native commands work, which is awesome. So if you're in PowerShell and you run top, it'll work. But remember the PowerShell command precedence, because this matters. Aliases, the default aliases are different between Linux and Windows also. So ls is a command in Linux, but it's an alias in Windows, okay? Then you go to function, then you go to commandlet, and then you go to executable. Oh, if it was only that simple. Because you need to know your command search order as well. 
In memory modules, functions, commandlets, and aliases, even though I read them out of order, load first because they're in memory. Then PowerShell uses the PS module auto loading preference to figure out what to do next. All right, I'm not gonna tell you how your environment is because your environment may be different than mine. You just need to know this so that when you're loading something, you're actually loading the right command. ENV path, that's the other part, is PowerShell will load from the paths, right? Where the executables are. So that's where it's gonna search for the native commands, those executables, okay? And why are the Linux variables all caps and the windows are mixed? Like, it's a PowerShell thing. Why didn't they just, whatever, whatever. All right. You, you have an answer to that one? All right, let's do it as soon as I finish because I'm at the finish because I want to hear this. I really want to know. You're going to tell me what I really, really want to know? Really, really want. Okay, there you go. That's what I was looking for. All right, I've stalled enough on this joke. You've read it. It's the summary judgment. Just for, just for reasons, when I did this presentation one other time, I had judgment in there and someone went, how did you miss the obvious pun? And I was like, credit where credit is due. Having PowerShell installed on Linux can help you, especially with complex commands. Using the pipeline, pipeline in bash, oh, rough, and parsing text. So PowerShell will make you more effective, especially if you're already savvy. And remember the living off the land principles because you still need to know the Linux commands and that objects matter. I showed you. But then familiarity will speed your adoption. You're gonna be a better Linux admin if you put PowerShell on your Linux servers, you're gonna get faster. That's the point. And being a both and administrator is valuable. That's useful to you in your career. In fact, Don Jones gave a talk about this at PowerShell in 2019, and I don't remember exactly, but it was the core concept was yes and. I do this cloud and that cloud. I do PowerShell and Bash, PowerShell and Python. This and that. You need to be bigger than just one technology. And remember how skills rhyme. It's back to the same thing. If you can write PowerShell, then conceptually, because you can write good, solid PowerShell, the logic process fits for other languages as well. So I'm gonna give you a goodbye function. You just brace yourselves. For each win in your life, your strife, gotta say it right, for each win in your strife, if you sharpen like knife, this may be a gimmick, it's also a limerick, so go forth and shortcut your life. <laughs> yes, yes, the rubber duck approves. Please stay in touch. This is my info. I will gladly put this slide back up. But what really matters, by the way, the last slide, the, I mean the last item there, shortcut your dot life. Yes, that is a, a site that I put up right now. It redirects to my blog, but I'm going to be putting other things up there. Hopefully, I'm going to get a merch store for my stuff, but we'll, we'll see. Finally, Thank you very much for attending. I hope this is valuable too. I love presenting to you. <laughs> Only five star reviews will be accepted. Thank you very much. <laughs> oh yes, we have an explanation here for this. I want to, I can't wait. Okay, I'm gonna repeat for the recording. James says that the environment variables in Linux, and he's right, I've seen this a lot, they're all caps. The environment variable. So the dollar env colon, yeah, that's the PowerShell part, but the rest of it is the Linux bit, and those things will hurt you at some point. You're going to run into that, and you'll be like, why? Uh, the question was, does autocomplete fix that for you? Fun fact: If you do make dir temp all lowercase, and then you do make dir temp capital T emp, and then you do make dir temp caps lock, T-E-M-P, because you're a monster, and then you say, you go to that directory and you say T-Tab, and you did the lowercase one, it's going to be confused as to which one to give you, because they're all PowerShell compliant, so it's gonna be looking for, all right, which one? Now, if you started with a lowercase one, it's gonna give you the lowercase T-E-M-P because the other ones don't match. But if you do an uppercase T and you hit tab, it's gonna say, 
and then you press it again, you're gonna get temp, T, capital T, lowercase, and then the other one, all uppercase. Don't do that to yourselves. <laughs> Just don't, all right. Case, case, case sensitivity, case insensitive, insensitivity. If you've been down that road, you know how rugged it can be. Now, you guys all stuck around, I appreciate it. Time for swag.